Hello, Emma. Could you explain the structure of the lungs, please? Of course. Let's start with the basics. The right lung, known as pulmodexter, has three lobes, the superior lobe, the middle lobe, and the inferior lobe. These lobes are separated by fissures. The horizontal fissure is a small interloper fissure between the superior and middle lobes, while the oblique fissure is a larger interloper fissure between the middle and inferior lobes. And what about the left lung? The left lung, or pulmosinister, has two lobes, the superior lobe and the inferior lobe. It also features a unique projection called the lingula, which is a tongue-like extension of the lung that corresponds to the middle lobe in the right lung. The left lung also has an oblique fissure separating its two lobes. What about the segments within the lungs? The lobes are further divided into smaller functional units called segments. These segments are not separated by interloper fissures, but by fibrous septa. The right lung typically has 10 segments. The superior lobe has three segments, apical, posterior, and anterior. The middle lobe has two segments, lateral and medial. The inferior lobe has five segments, superior basal, also called apical, medial basal, also called cardiac, anterior basal, lateral basal, and posterior basal. How are the segments in the left lung organized? In the left lung, some segments merge into single functional units, resulting in a total of eight segments. The superior lobe includes the apico-posterior, anterior, superior lingular, and inferior lingular segments. The inferior lobe consists of the superior basal, medial basal, anterior basal, lateral basal, and posterior basal segments. Why is it important to know the segmental arrangement of the lungs? Understanding the segmental arrangement is crucial for several reasons. When planning lung resections, which involve removing diseased lung tissue, surgeons need to know the precise layout to preserve as much healthy tissue as possible. It's also essential for bronchoscopy, a procedure to explore the inner parts of the airways and detect abnormalities like foreign bodies or tumors. Additionally, precise localization of tumors relies on this detailed anatomical knowledge. How are these segments supplied with blood and air? Each lung segment is supplied by its own segmental bronchus and a segmental pulmonary artery. This ensures that each segment can function somewhat independently. However, the pulmonary veins do not strictly follow the segmental pattern and tend to run in a different direction. The segments are conical in shape, with the apex pointing towards the hilum, the central part of the lung where the bronchus, arteries, and veins enter and exit. What about the lymphatic drainage and overall structure within a segment? At the center of each segment, you'll find the bronchus, a branch of the pulmonary artery, a branch of the bronchial artery, which supplies nutrients, and the central lymphatic drainage. The periphery of each segment is surrounded by a fibrous septum, and around the septum, you'll find branches of the pulmonary veins and peripheral lymphatic drainage. This is incredibly detailed. Why is this level of detail necessary? This detailed understanding is crucial for accurately diagnosing and treating various lung conditions. For instance, during a bronchoscopy or surgical procedure, knowing the precise anatomy helps avoid complications and ensures the best outcomes for patients. Could you explain the different parts of the lungs? Certainly. Let's break it down. The apex of the lung, or apex pulmonis, is the topmost part. The lung surface facing the mediastinum, called the facies pulmonalis, is where the lung connects to the mediastinum via the hilum. The hilum is an essential area as it includes the bronchus, pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins, bronchial arteries, nerves, lymphatic vessels, and nodes. Interestingly, on the right side, the bronchus is situated highest, whereas on the left side, the pulmonary artery is the highest structure. What are the other surfaces of the lung? The facies costalis is the largest surface, and it lies adjacent to the ribs. Then we have the facies diaphragmatica, which is the surface that rests on the diaphragm. The base of the lung, or basis pulmonis, is close to the diaphragm as well. Are there any variations in lung structure? Yes, the lungs can exhibit certain variations. For instance, a tracheal bronchus, which is rare in humans, supplies the upper lobe of either the right or left lung and originates directly from the trachea. 
This is common in some mammals, like domestic pigs. There's also accessory loperization, where a part of the lung is separated by its interloper fissure. Examples include the lingular lobe of the left lung and the azygous lobe on the mediastinal surface of the right lung. What about pulmonary sequestration? Pulmonary sequestration is a condition where lung tissue is not connected to the pulmonary circulation and is instead supplied by the bronchial artery. This means the sequestered lung tissue receives blood differently than the rest of the lung. How is lung tissue functionally organized? On a finer level, lung tissue is divided into smaller units. We differentiate between 15 orders of bronchial branches and 5 orders of bronchioles. Bronchioles form functional units known as secondary lobules, which consist of three to five terminal bronchioles. A terminal bronchiole is the last airway branch that does not contain alveoli. Each primary lobule is supplied by one terminal bronchiole, leading to the asinus, which includes three orders of respiratory bronchioles and alveoli within their walls. This continues to alveolar ducts and finally to alveolar sacs containing several alveoli. Can you explain secondary lobules in more detail? Sure. The term secondary lobule comes from radiology. These structures, about 1 to 1.5 centimeters in size, are the smallest units visible on a radiograph. They have a fibrous boundary and are supplied by 3 to 5 terminal bronchioles. Each secondary lobule contains smaller units called asini, separated by interlobular septa, which also carry the pulmonary veins and lymphatic vessels. Within the lobule, intralobular septa separate individual asini. These septa can show characteristic changes in various pathological conditions visible on CT or X-ray images, such as interstitial pulmonary edema, alveolar pulmonary edema, interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, and lung inflammations like COVID-19. How does blood flow within the lungs? Deoxygenated blood flows into the lung tissue, where it reaches the alveoli for oxygenation. This oxygenated blood then flows laterally and outward. Deoxygenated blood moves along the axis of the secondary lobule, while oxygenated blood flows outwards along the periphery. The bronchial artery branches along the bronchi, providing additional blood supply. What about the pulmonary interstitium? The pulmonary interstitium is the tissue that forms the framework of the lung. It runs alongside central branching structures within asini and on their surfaces along with veins and lymphatic drainage. Interstitial lung processes can affect these areas and are critical for maintaining the structural integrity of the lungs. Thank you, Emma, for the detailed explanation. You're welcome. Understanding these details is vital for diagnosing and treating various lung conditions effectively.